So, good evening, everyone. Um, it's really full house here. Um, it's really a pleasure to have, to have actually for the second time to get as a Max Weber lecturer, Jesta Esping Anderson here. Um, I think Jesta gave the Max Weber lecture probably 10 years ago or 15 years ago, but as the uh, presence here shows today that it's like the Rolling Stones are always able to pull a full house no matter how often he comes. Um, <clears throat> the occasion that, that um, why he's here this time is that he just received the Cawley Award from the Cawley Foundation for Sociology for his uh, lifetime contributions to the discipline. And as part of that uh, award ceremony is that he's gonna deliver, uh, del deliver a Max Weber lecture to us. But I'll leave further introduction to uh, Professor Esping Anderson's work to uh, our Max Weber fellow Camille Portier. Thank you. So it's my pleasure to welcome today Professor Josta Esping Anderson for the second Max Weber lecture of the year. So really his work transcends both disciplinary and geographical boundaries. So Professor Espin Anderson is a scholar whose contribution to the field of sociology, demography and political sciences have had a profound and lasting impact on our understanding of welfare systems family demography and social inequalities. So born in Denmark, he completed his graduate studies at the University of Madison, Wisconsin, and has taught since then in the US and Italy and in Spain. So he currently is an emeritus professor at the, um, of sociology at the University of Pompeu Fabra in Barcelona and a distinguished research professor at the University of Bocconi. So he's been elected members, um, an elected member, sorry, of the British Academy and also the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He's also been awarded the Dr. Honoris Causa Award from the University of Copenhagen, Roskilde and Oslo. So his first kind of, or second, now that I understand better, research epoch is really marked by his scholarship on the concept of the welfare state regime. So his seminal work, The Three Worlds of Welfare Capitalism, published in 1990, has become a funda foundational text in so social sciences. So this body of work has provided researchers and policymakers with a comprehensive and comparative politic comparative approach to understanding the diverse structures and outcomes of welfare policies across different countries. More recently, he's been focusing on two strands of research, one in family demography and one in social inequality and social stratification. The former strongly focuses on how women's changing role influence family dynamics, while the latter explore how social mobility influences demographic outcomes such as partnering and divorce risks. His scholarship has has been recognized with numerous awards and honors with the last and date the Collier Prize for Sociology and his influence has transcended academic boundaries to inform international organization, including the United Nations, OECD, ISSA and the European Union. So please join me in extending a warm welcome to Professor Espen Anderson as he shares some of his work in family demography in today's lecture. Thank you, Camille. Uh, well, I'm not gonna give a paper jam packed with regression coefficients. Uh, I'm gonna try instead to give sort of a summary of the kind of the, the work I've been engaged in over the past three, four, five, six years. Uh, it's kind of a synthesis of my work on changing families in contemporary societies. Uh, and that's uh, why I chose this um, title, Where's the Family Going? Uh, very pretentiously, I put it in, in Latin, um, but it just means, where's the family going? And it's going, it's moving between what I call two equilibria. And this is what I, I'm pulling out of sort of my economics background. Uh, and I'm going to explain what I mean about this equilibrium change. Let us begin. Uh, what I said it was, it's not going to be a highly scientific paper. It's going to be a little bit, not pop, but a little bit sort of easygoing. Uh, but my the question is then, where is the family going? And we have 
bids in the literature, if anybody's familiar with sort of social uh, demography, you're very well acquainted with the work of Ron Lestag and others who embrace the notion of the second demographic transition. The idea being that the new values and of post, what they call postmodern values are eroding family life in the family structure. We are less and less family, more and more individualized, pursuing individual interests over more collective types of, of, of uh, uh, identities. Um, so we're trying to realize ourselves instead of realizing families. Gary Becker's uh, new economics, home economics, is does not predict the end of the family, but implicitly, given that his emphasis was on the uh, distinctive roles and division of labor between partners in families, uh, one being uh, centered on home production, the other one on and earning money. Once you start having an erosion of that role division, you would also expect much less family uh, coming out of a Baker, th Baker's theoretical tradition. It would also mean that, of course, if you have a changing role of women and women become more masculinized in terms of their economic life course, that the opportunity cost of having children will rise given the alternatives that women and men in partnerships would have in terms of maximizing income and so forth and so on. So the utility of marriage, according to Baker, would also decline. So this is what family looked like ideal, ideal typically in the good old days when family was family, according to uh, Lestag. This was pre-postmodern values. And as you notice, uh, the males are always sitting down and being served by a female. Now, is this the postmodern family? Uh, this is sort of what we would predict in a way from the kind of postmodern thesis that is, there, if there are any children, there are very few of them, and they're kind of getting in the way of things in disturbing the life of people. But by and large, it's individual self-realization. So if we look back at pre-2000 decades, starting somewhere in the 70s, late 60s, early 70s, the, the less target uh, postmodern thesis seemed to be perfectly validated. Marriages were going down, fertility was going down and continued to go down. Divorces were rising, instability of partnerships increasing. But one thing that the postmodern thesis has sort of ignored is that fertility preferences are surprisingly stable. Preferences are stable. Reality of fertility is not. And, and this is what a lot of my talk today is going to be about. In some countries, we are beginning to see a reversal of that trend, which is beginning to contradict the whole second demographic transition theory. So if that is the case, we need an alternative theory. And I think I'm going to try to put it together a couple of bricks and pieces and maybe a little bit cement to start off a, theor a new theoretical interpretation of the dynamics as they're unfolding in our epoch. But here are the preferences that I mentioned, stable, but not in all countries. There are a couple of countries that conform to the second demographic transition prediction. And they're called Germany and Austria. But there are exceptions. 
But look at Denmark, look at Sweden here or UK, and you would also get exactly the same pattern if you looked at the US or if you looked at France and even Spain. The two child preference remains very stable and persistent. So that already begins to to provoke a little bit doubts about second demographic transition and postmodern decline of family if people really still want those uh, in the number of children that they were used to having also in old, older and very older cohorts. And also the parity preferences, that is the number of children the no kids scenario that we would expect in the second demographic transition, or at least one kid max, is very minoritarian. The two kid preference and even three kid three kid preference remains extremely dominant in the overall picture of preferences. So should we rethink theory? And my answer is yes. Uh, and how should we rethink theory? And I propose we put women at center stage. The revolution of women's roles is what is driving family change in contemporary societies today. And the question is, are men also changing their roles? And if they are, then we may be moving into a new equilibrium that historically we've never seen. So family equilibrium. Point A was the, where my photo started. Uh, the stable fa family in which the partnerships were we had roles that were very clearly defined and differentiated with a woman at home taking care of the kids and taking care of the household and the male being the breadwinner. That model reproduced itself cohort after cohort, cohort in generation after generation, because it was in equilibrium. Well, what does it mean to be in equilibrium? It means that you're automatically reproducing the same role divisions, the same definition of what's good and bad and what's proper and what's not proper, what is normatively correct. And that is how the patterns of gender relationships were reproduced and reproduced over generations. Something has to provoke change and that in equilibrium theory is some kind of exogenous shocks. What were those exogenous shocks? I would highlight two. One is the pill that allowed women finally to control the fertility, to have the number of kids they really wanted. And some dem historical demographers argue that even more than 100 years back in time, that the two child preference was dominant also in history. Uh, people had many more children than they really wanted. And also because of, of child mortality, they had more children. But another factor, exogenous, another exogenous shock that has come to the, fa the family was household technologies. It took three hours plus to do a laundry before the laundry machine was invented and became the commonplace in all families. Now it takes about three minutes to put in the clothes, press a button. Three hours saved every three days or so. All these household technologies were labor saving. That meant that the woman's traditional role became empty, more and more emptied, and more and more time was freed up. And that was another exogenous catalyst of changing women's roles. 
when you have multiple equilibrium, and that's point B in my curve, that's when you have competing norms, competing ideas of what is family, what is a good and what is a bad partnership, and what are your sort of life course, what is your life course definition of a good life? In the old days, it was a stable marriage, and then it's become increasingly uh, much more heterogeneous in terms of what are actually people's ideas of partnerships, of family, of uh, living arrangements throughout one's life, across the life course, right? And that's point B, where we have normative confusion, or what economists wrongly call multiple equilibrium, uh, because there is no dominant equilibrium at all. The question is, are we on our way to point C? And that is a new equilibrium that, like the old one at point A, was stable across cohorts and generations and reproduced itself automatically in terms of the norms and values of a new order in terms of having family. Are we moving towards C? That is the big question. If so, we would be consolidating a new gender egalitarian equilibrium because the only basis, of, and that's the argument I'm going to make, the only basis upon which we can have, or at least imagine, having stable, lifelong partnerships and return to something that approximates the number of children you really want is that we incorporate into our models or into the model of our society that a new definition of gender and gender roles. Gender egalitarian equilibrium is a precondition for returning to more family rather than less family. So how can we identify a new gender egalitarian equilibrium? Well, let's begin with men and men's contribution to domestic work. Uh, I just took three countries that represent kind of the differences in trajectories over the past many decades. As you will see, Denmark didn't start particularly impressive in terms of gender egalitarianism. In fact, back in the 60s, Germany was German men were a little bit more gender egalitarian than were Danish men. And then suddenly Denmark takes off. Sweden took off. But some countries, Italy being one, didn't take off at all. Something pushed Danish men to become more gender egalitarian. And are they, how much are they? The average Danish male contributes more than 40%, and that's the same in, in Sweden and Norway, more than 40% to all domestic work. It's not exactly 50-50, but within a range of, you could call, sort of egalitarianism. 30% of men, Danish men contribute more to household work than does the female partner. That's pretty impressive. What is the odds of men being traditional, doing almost nothing, or being egalitarian in, in, in terms of housework? And here I, I use Danish data uh, to uh, examine uh, what are the conditions? Most work in this area highlights the importance of education, rightly so. The, the gender egalitarianism is very concentrated among the higher educated, and it's not particularly evolving in a clear way among the low educated. And you can see there is a statistical significant effect of being edu highly educated in terms of the gen the male contributing more than 40% in Denmark. But look at 
the bottom row when she's a full-time worker. And the typical Scandinavian woman is now full-time for life with the exception of maternity leave or part-time for at least for the more educated women in Scandinavia now is a passage, it's not a status. It is a transition from maternity leave back into a full-time status of employment. And look at the effect of she is a full-time worker that doubles the probability that the male partner will contribute more than 40%. Is a much more powerful driver than is education, comparatively speaking. Another thing that we have to take into consideration here is it easier for men today to start contributing a lot because the amount of housework measured in terms of hours necessary to clean the house, make the food and so forth and so on has gone down so dramatically that it's easy to enter. In the old days, it was difficult to enter from a, the point of view of the male said, oh, no, that's a lot of work. It's easy today because it's not particularly a lot of work. So, back to my equilibrium. Uh, and the question here is, is there a substantial amount of couples who, according to my own definitions, are clearly in a gender egalitarian type of gender symmetric arrangement uh, and that they're so in a convincing way. And in Denmark, it's a little bit above half of the Danish population of, of uh, households in which you have gender egalitarian, truly gender symmetric and gender egalitarian couples. Look at Spain, zero. Uh, it might have changed. This is data from Spain is a little bit out, uh, outdated, but I think in the most recent time use uh, survey, you might find a little bit better performance in, in Spain. But Britain, in, even Britain looks pretty miserably bad from the point of view of gender egalitarianism. Mm. Gender asymmetries, are very, very, very marginal in Denmark, and they're dominant of basically in both in Britain and Spain. That is, the women do too much, relatively, comparatively speaking, in terms of housework, cleaning, cooking, so forth. I exclude here childcare, by the way. So is there a U-turn? Are we moving towards point C? And is it genuine? And is it driven by gender egalitarianism? Yes or no? So here, this is TFR data. And as you can see, there is a group of countries in which you have the U. There's a return of fertility. Uh, Scandinavian countries being that, US being that. And then there's a group of countries where it's not happening. And they're called Southern Europe in particular, but they're also called, called now Japan and several Southeast Asian countries are also now moving into that, what looks like a long-term, very low uh, fertility level. Sorry. Oops, sorry, I made a mistake there. But, those of you who work in this area will say, wait a minute, because in the last couple of years, we see even Scandinavian countries' fertility rates have gone down. And that's also the case in the US, and it's also the case in the UK. In several countries, France even also, suddenly we have a drop where I had predicted that you shaped upward curve of fertility, or at least stabilizing around something of close to the two-child norm. If 
but suddenly it's gone down and it's not because of covid it's it's all happening somewhere around 2015 16 17 somewhere like that about seven eight years ago so what is happening there if you however look at tempo adjusted tfr that is you adjust for when people are having children are they postponing yes or no and that's what's called tempo adjustment then fertility actually ends up looking very stable there's also if you look at the birth order data again we look at a pattern that is very stable and that is what i illustrate here with the case of sweden so is there a second transition of fertility and that is my hypothesis and here is a fantastic theme for a doctoral dissertation because nobody's done it and that is we had that postponement of fertility among the higher educated so now the average age of first birth is somewhere around 31 years of age for women but the low educated remained quite young in terms of first births so you had a uh, dispersion or a, a, a big gap in terms of the average age of first birth. What I think is happening right now, we don't really have the data yet to test it, is that low educated women are also postponing the first birth. So there's convergence in terms of postponement and that is what's driving down the fertility rates. But the reasons why low educated women are postponing are completely different from why the high educated postpone. The high educated postpone because of education, starting their careers, and then forming stable partnerships and beginning also having for having children. That is not what's driving postponement among the low educated, in my view. The low educated is because very low educated men are unmarriageable women don't want to partner with very low educated men and that's one reason and 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 if they do partnerships are very unstable and problematic and that is why we have higher and higher uh, divorce rates and separation rates among the very low educated but more and more stability among the high educated Another way to look at gender egalitarianism is lifelong singlehood. It used to be the case that higher educated women had to choose between family or career. And the very career-minded high educated women, they would go for career and then sacrifice family, kids, and so forth and so on along the way. And that is really what I'm trying to catch here namely lifelong singlehood. And as you see, it's uh, inverse view. That is, where gender, it, it's, it's it, on, on the axis there, is, I call it gender equity squared. It's the degree of gender egalitarianism, essentially. So when you had very traditional societies, there was also very little lifelong singlehood. Then it rises and more the doubles once you get into sort of that women's role change has, has started getting underway. And then once you have more mature uh, development of women's new roles and more gender egalitarianism, then lifelong singlehood uh, it starts falling again. So, I, measure, I should say, I measure lifelong singlehood that no woman was partnered for more than six months up to age 50. All right. Divorce trends. Look at this. Minus, minus, minus in countries that we would call relatively gender egalitarian. 
where women's role change is very advanced. Sweden, Iceland, US, to, you know, so minus, that is, could divorce rates start going down? Look at the more traditional countries, where Portugal and Spain are exceptional because divorce was prohibited during Franco and, and uh, Salazar and post-Franco period and when the, when divorce was finally lib uh, liberalized in, in Spain, for example, you had an explosion of formal divorce rates. And that's what we're capturing also here. So another test of gender egalitarianism. So traditionally, if the woman starts becoming the main earner in a couple, men would start, uh -huh, but this is not particularly good. It's destroying my male identity as the prime earner of the family and the breadwinner status of, of the male when the female becomes the dominant earner. So here's the test. This is Danish registry data I've used here. <clears throat> And I'm comparing two marriage cohorts or partnership cohorts, I should call it, because it's also uh, cohabitation. Um, and I compare the low educated and the high educated. And the first cohort was partnered in 1980. And the second one is two decades later. And this more or less captures the shift from relatively traditional partnerships in 70s, 80s, into modern partnerships, the 2000 plus, all right? And what's, what's the odds of divorce when she becomes the main earner? And here I have a strong definition of that she's the main earner. First of all, she has to be a main earner more than two years. Secondly, she has to be more than, I can't remember if it was 55 or 60% of total income of, of the, household. So it's clear that she is really the powerhouse in terms of family income generation. And look at what happens. Huge decline in the divorce propensity. Among the high educated, it doesn't matter anymore. Whether she's the boss or he's the boss, they don't care anymore. And that's gender egalitarianism as far as I'm concerned. The low educated, they are also uh, improving in terms of uh, the statistics, but they're not yet there at the zero effect. So if the return to family again, now based on gender symmetry, gender egalitarianism, is clearly spearheaded, spearheaded by the higher educated. Does that, if the low educated don't follow suit, are we facing a world of family polarization? And that is one of the big questions right now in sort of family sociology, family demography, the polarizing view of what's happening. Here is a first exemplification of clear polarization, namely divorce trends among the low educated going up, up, up among the high educated, stabilizing down. And the gap is just increasing and increasing and increasing. Also, here's the relative divorce propensity. And this is the ratio of low educated over high educated. And here I have Denmark, Germany, and the US representing my three worlds of welfare capitalism. Uh, I didn't have Danish data for the 70s. It just simply is impossible to do, but the trend is clear. The ratio, the ratio of divorce propensity is clearly more and more powerfully dominated by high divorce rates among the low educated and less among the high educated polarization. And here we're back to the lifelong singlehood. Look at the difference here. The, the big curve that I showed before 
was all dominated by the high educated women. Nothing really has happened in terms of gender equality among the low educated. It is all among the high educated. So the, again, the difference here in terms of lifelong singlehood effects was all driven by high educated women. And here's another way to do it. And here, I like very much my graphs here because it shows that once upon a time, and that's the 1980s data, the world looks like List Hogg and the second demographic transition thesis would like us to believe. Namely, more and more and more divorce, the more and more also among high educated. Uh, and or among, in this case, also among the gender egalitarians. That was the world of the 1980s. The more and more that women were moving up, the more you had divorce. Look at 2010, the uh, second uh, inverse U. So now gender egalitarianism, the more there is of that, the less divorce. So inverse U. And finally, fertility. And again, I compare 1980, we skip the one in the middle and up to 2010. So again, we're comparing exactly the same 30 year change. So look at what, it, what fertility patterns look like in 1980, the uh, graph most at the left, U-shaped. So the very gender egalitarian societies, Sweden, Denmark at that time were the most, and the US had relatively high fertility. Uh, and we saw that also earlier. And the very unegalitarian, ungender egalitarian societies had high fertility, Romania, Bulgaria kind of countries. Now look what the pattern looks like 30 years later, 2010. The gender egalitarianism effect has moved the entire distribution completely to the right. There are no Bulgarias and Romanias anymore with zero gender egalitarianism and high fertility. In Europe, that, that old model has simply disappeared. But we have a lot of countries concentrated down with very low fertility, lowest low fertility in many of these countries that are moving, but not decisively towards gender egalitarianism. And then we have a group of countries, again, dominated by Scandinavia, North America, <clears throat> where the gender <clears throat> egalitarianism is quite advanced and where you have a recovery of fertility that I discussed earlier. So I don't I cannot give a final answer. Only history can give that. And we're in the middle of that historical transition. Whether we will arrive at point C is an open question. And there is more and more evidence. Paula England has written a lot about this, that the United States has stopped its move towards gender egalitarianism. And it's very clear, all US data show a pattern of like a two thirds society moving towards more gender egalitarianism. And then there's a one third that remains very traditional with a housewife model still quite dominant and the male breadwinner model still dominant. So it's kind of 30% versus 70% in the US and it stopped at that point. Whereas in Scandinavia, the gender egalitarianism is there's no, it, there's no woman who is not employed in Denmark or Sweden, except if they're in maternity or if they are ladies of luxury that spend their time uh, buying clothes and uh, jewelry or going to the spa. 
So the return may be true. And if, if it really is true, that is really good news but maybe not so much for the male side of the coin. And here comes my last photo. Is this the gender egalitarian family equilibrium viewed from the point of view of the male that now the men are gonna do it all and the women can enjoy life just like men once upon a time went to football games while the wife was cleaning the floors. Now it's the male who's cleaning the floors while the wife has a nice time uh, swimming around town. Is that the new family equilibrium? I don't think so. And let's hope not, at least from the male point of view. And I think I just stopped there. And thank you very much.